Hello and welcome to DAS Nostalgia. I'm Anatoly, and today we're taking a look at a shareware classic Hugo's House of Horrors. Its story began when David Gray moved from the UK to the US to write air traffic control software. Having become familiar with the US business practice of laying off entire departments, David started thinking about a plan B should his employment be suddenly terminated. In 1988, he started the one-man software company Gray Design Associates, but his first two products, which were business software, were commercial failures. By chance, Gray ran into a gynecologist at a party in 1989 who told him that he was successfully selling his own software written in BASIC all over the world as shareware. That gave David an idea. Inspired by Sierra adventure game Leisure Suit Larry and an early PC shareware platformer The Adventures of Captain Comic, he armed himself with ZSoft Paintbrush and Microsoft Quick C and after three months of development, on January 1st, 1990, released Hugo's House of Horrors. The game opens at night in front of a classic clip art scary house where Hugo, the titular protagonist, arrives to look for his missing girlfriend Penelope. Your goal? Locate Penelope within the house full of ghouls and rescue her by solving inventory puzzles. The game itself is rather basic and influence of early CR games is very apparent. It has a very certain one-man team charm to it in everything from amateurish graphics to rare PC speaker sound effects. There are a few deaths here and there that are only mildly annoying, but there are plenty of goofy moments like the dining room full of ghouls and a moment in a lab where a mad scientist's assistant keeps pressing wrong buttons, each having a different effect on Hugo. The game of course isn't without its flaws. Some can be forgiven like its extremely short length, after all the entire game was available for free. The text parser, however, is a bit more annoying as your words often have to be quite specific and most of the time you can't get away with use so-and-so item on a such-and-such -such thing. There's also an action sequence involving a mummy. Some other stuff is incredibly unfair, like this secret passage between the two rocks in the basement that's not hinted at in any way. But hands down the most ridiculous part is the quiz. You see, at the end of the game you encounter an old man who asks you seven questions that you need to answer correctly in order to proceed. And he gives you no second chances. All of the questions require pre-existing knowledge. And while some are fairly easy questions about literature that just about anyone should know, such as what was the first name of the hero in The Hobbit, others are a bit more devious. One of the questions is, what's the name of the only mammal that can't fly that can fly? The answer is obviously a human. But the old man won't accept the word human as an answer. You have to say man, otherwise you'll be stuck at a dead end. But the most ridiculous question is, what was the name of Roy Rogers' dog? Really now? I love how the game puts questions about The Hobbit, Narnia, Bram Stoker's Dracula and freaking Roy Rogers in the same category. Anyway, after you rescue Penelope, you still have completely no idea about who imprisoned her or why. The end. So, as you might have figured out, this wasn't a very good game. In fact, it's not good at all. So why was it so popular? Well, David discovered an untapped market. There weren't many games that imitated the style of Sierra's mid-80s adventure games. And there definitely weren't any that were given away in its entirety as classic shareware, meaning a complete product was available to distribute and play. This was new and exciting, and people were willing to overlook the game's rough edges in favor of its charm. The game spread like fire. Paying $20 would give you a text file with hints, an ability to disable sound, an option for the game to play itself, and another game when available. After a while, David even made a few deals with distributors who put the game in various retail markets. He began making enough money to quit his job and concentrate on game development. The second game, Hugo 2 Who Done It, arrived a year later in 1991, and the third game, Hugo 3 Jungle of Doom, was released in 1992. Believe it or not, but David didn't use the shareware model popularized by Apogee, where just a third of the trilogy was available for free and the rest required a payment. Originally, each of the games was available for free in its entirety, with a registration price of $20 each, or $40 for the whole trilogy after the third game was completed. P. 
people really enjoyed these games and were happy to pay money for them. In 1994, a new game in the series appeared. A family-friendly first-person shooter, Nightmare 3D. At the end of the year, it was ported to Windows 3.1, with the original Adventure Trilogy also following the suit in 1995. Inspired by Beneath a Steel Sky, David spruced up the games with new sounds and music, and added a point-and-click interface. He finally adopted the Apogee distribution model for his versions, and renamed all of the games for a reason even he himself can't remember anymore. In 1996, David decided to switch to making virtual Jigsaw games, and that's what he has been doing ever since. So back to Hugo's House of Horrors. Do I think this game is worth playing? Yes, I do. Especially since you can get it for free easily since it's a rather famous piece of 90s shareware. While you're at it, you can also look for shareware versions of second and third games and play them both for free as well, if you like. And if you want to go above and beyond, you can even buy the games from GOG.com for $5.99 or directly from David himself for $10. The games will work not only in DOSBox, but also in Scum VM, so now you can play these games on all kinds of devices. Play Hugo's House of Horrors this Halloween, and remind yourself what an indie game success story was like 26 years ago. Thank you for watching. And this is it for this DOS Nostalgia video, and a special thanks as always goes out to these awesome DOS enthusiasts, without whom this episode of DOS Nostalgia would not exist. If you enjoyed this video, subscribe to the channel, check out my other videos, and consider supporting DOS Nostalgia on Patreon to see more videos like this one. Thank you again.